know about you, but for the past five months, I have been sort of uh, in a state of like a twilight zone, like say, like since November 8th at about 11.43 p.m. I have been in this like twilight state where I wake, I wake up and I'm like, no, nah, this, this ain't real. Like I'm turning on the TV expecting there to be a different face as the president and like a different Supreme Court nominee. But it's starting to sink in, I think, going on six months, six months later that this is real, right? That this really happened. Uh, but I always say, you know, and I will say this, you know, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, born and raised, and I remember what it was like to be in New York for 9-11. And on in Inauguration Day, on Inauguration Day in January, New York felt like a funeral. It felt like a funeral, y'all. We were mourning. We were clearly mourning over a country we might have had, a future we could have been building, a president we should have been welcoming. We were mourning. But, you know, for me, there was one good thing that came out of November 8th. There really was. That, the, that on November 8th, when 65 million Americans decided to vote for a reality television star with no legislative experience, there was one good thing that came out of that experience. America finally told the truth. America told the truth. It told the truth about the way it feels about women. It told the truth about the way it feels about undocumented folk. It told the truth about the way it feels about Mexicans. America told the truth. It told the truth about the way it feels about Muslims, the way it feels about a women's, woman's right to choose, the way it feels about disabled folk and LGBTQ folk. America told the truth. And so I come from a tradition that says truth is always the precondition for transformation. So it was an ugly truth, but it was the truth nonetheless. And so we kind of got to give America some credit for telling the truth. And so I think the question for organizers is, now that America has told the truth, what are we going to do about it? That's the organizing question for this moment. Part of what, and, I, and I, I have sort of five things to say about that, what we do from here. First, we need to step back and realize where we are in history. We need to be able to situate ourselves in history. We know that one of the ways that white supremacy as a practice tends to uh, operationalize itself historically is that there's usually a period of progress followed by that swift and virulent backlash. Now, y'all already know this story, right? It began in the 19th century. You had all of the uh, emancipatory, the, the gains of the, of, of the era of the age of emancipation, right? The passage of the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, the so-called freedom amendments, the emancipation of African slaves, uh, the onset of the first black senators. It was a period of relative progress in the United States. And it was followed up immediately by what? Uh, the uh, new dawn of state-sanctioned state -sanctioned lynching, post-reconstruction, 100 years of terror in the form of Jim Crow, Jane Crow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, those rolling backs. We know the same thing happened in the middle of the 20th century. We had all of the legislative gains of the Civil Rights Movement. You had the passing of the Voting Rights Act, the passing of the Fair Housing Act, uh, Brown versus Board, all of the sort of gains that we had from the 1960s Im immediately undercut by what? The realignment of the Republican Party, the birth of the Southern strategy, uh, the war on drugs and the war on poverty, which were really wars on black people. Let's be really clear, because if they wanted a war on drugs, they could have started at NYU or Harvard University or Yale or Princeton, but they started in Flatbush and Ferguson and, and these ghettoized spaces, right? So we know the war on drugs was a war on black people, the, the, the rise of the Reagan revolution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What am I getting at? We are essentially living in a third reconstruction. This is a third reconstruction. And so we need to be clear about that. The, the historian William Jelani Cobb refers to this as the paradox of progress. But you know, my friend James Baldwin uh, had a better word for it. He called it the price of the ticket. And that in many ways, what we are experiencing now is the price of all the uprisings we've seen over the course of the past eight years. All the progress, all the people out in the street, all the resistance, all the unapologeticness, unapologetically black, black girl magic, black boy magic, it came with a price, right? Reconstructions always do. And so we are living in the aftermath of that price. This is the price of the ticket that Baldwin was talking about. 